Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Bible Study. For broadcast times in your area of these studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now it's time to begin our Sunday study with your speaker, Chris McCann. Hello, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. Today is study number 7 of Joel chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 10 and 11. Joel 2 verse 10. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, and Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Now, we've been reading in Joel chapter 2 of God's great army, and we've seen it is the army of his elect that he has finally completed. He has saved the last one to become saved, and this uh, is the 200 million that Revelation chapter 9 speaks of. It is the locust, also found in Revelation chapter 9. It is the army of clothed in fine white linen in Revelation chapter 19. It is the complete number of God's elect, and it is through the completion of their salvation that judgment day begins, and God then judges the world with his saints, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, and that's what has been illustrated here in the first several verses of Joel chapter 2. Leading up to verse 10, that says, The earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And as soon as we see this kind of language, uh, we've become very familiar with this type of language, we know right away that this is speaking of the time after the tribulation because that's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And therefore God locks in the timing as immediately after the tribulation. And uh, by God's grace, he has also revealed to us the biblical calendar of history. And we were able to lay out the church age through this calendar and lay out the beginning of the great tribulation, the end of the church age in the time of judgment beginning at the house of God, as May 21, 1988, and to lay out the 23 years, the exact 23 years, the 8,400 days of that great tribulation until May 21, 2011. May 21, 1988, 1988 through May 21, 2011, an exact 23 years 8,400 days, then the tribulation concluded and we entered into the time of those days after that tribulation, a time when the sun is dark, the moon does not give her light, and the stars are said to fall, and the heavens are shaken, as as well as the earth. Um, We read in Revelation chapter 6, It says in verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So God speaks 
of a great earthquake occurring simultaneously with the spiritual darkening of the world. And, of course, that would mean the earthquake is likewise spiritual. And it, it points to the shaking of the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of this world, and the loosing of the prisoners, as uh, we read in Acts chapter 16 of a miraculous great earthquake that only serves to accomplish the opening of the prison doors and the loosing of the bonds of the prisoners. And, and that points to what God did by that date of May 21, 2011. He released all of the captives, all of his predestinated captives, all those who were predestinated unto salvation that God had guaranteed would become saved in their lifetime, and, and he fulfilled his word, and he did save them all. Well, here in Revelation 2.10, we have additional confirmation. We're understanding this great army correctly. We're understanding the timing of the army as Judgment Day correctly. And verse 10 it gives us that assurance with this kind of language. The earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, um, there's just so many verses. Uh, by the way, the, the English word quake is a translation of the Hebrew word, which is Strong's number 7264. And at times, it is translated as tremble in, in other places. And the uh, English word tremble in Joel 2.10 is Strong's number 7493. And it, at other times in the Bible, is translated as quake. So these two words are uh, seemingly interchangeable as far as their definitions go. And they're found, for instance, um, in Isaiah 13, in Isaiah chapter 13, that chapter that speaks of the burden of Babylon and then describes the uh, punishment of the world. It says in Isaiah 13, verse 9, Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of Jehovah of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And the word shake is the word translated as quake in Joel 2.10. And the word remove is the other word, uh, 7493 in, in the concordance. And, and so we see that these two words uh, clearly identify in a passage where God is speaking of punishing the world. And, and it's the day of Jehovah's wrath. And uh, so there, there's no doubt how the Lord is using this kind of language in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 24, we find the word, the Hebrew word, 7493. In Isaiah 24, which is a chapter uh, in which God throughout is describing the destruction of the world and the day of judgment, he says in verse 17, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. 
And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. Now, uh, you might recognize that language that the windows from on high are open because that's the same language found in Genesis concerning the flood when God opened up the windows of heaven and the flood waters came upon the earth and and so here God is relating that language because it does relate is May 21 2011 was 7,000 years from the flood and had the equivalent uh, calendar date of 217, which was the underlying Hebrew calendar date. And that happened to be the very day that God did open up the windows of heaven and begin uh, pouring out the flood waters upon the earth. And, and it's tied to here the foundations of the earth do shake. And that's Strong 7493, which um, again is the word that we have in our verse. Well, let, let's look at a couple of other verses where 7493 is found. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10. But Jehovah is the true God, he is the living God, and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble. And the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. And, and there it is. The word tremble is the same word, 7493. And also in Jeremiah chapter 50, in verse 46, at the noise or at the um, voice of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved. And that is 7493 in in the Strong's Concordance. And the cry is heard among the nations. And of course, um, why at the the voice or or at the report of the taking of Babylon is the earth moved or shaken, trembling? Because at the taking of Babylon, historically occurred after the 70-year period, And that 70-year period typified the Great Tribulation. So after the end of 70 years, or at the end of the Great Tribulation, Babylon, the kingdom of Satan, this world is taken. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's when spiritually the earthquake occurs. Because the foundations of his entire kingdom of this world are shaken. And... All of the captives have been set free. And again, the light of the gospel goes dark. This is the language of the Bible that uh, we're finding in many places uh, in Scripture. And here it is again in Joel chapter 2, in verse 10. Let's go back there. And it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall shall be dark. And we've gone over this many times, so we're not going to spend too much time on it now. But the sun is a picture or a representation of God. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, the Lord God is a sun, S-U-N, and shield. And Jesus shines brilliantly with the sun, we read in Revelation. And Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. The sun is the great light of this world, and Christ is the great light of the world. And and so God identifies him with the sun, and the moon reflects the light of the sun, like the Bible, the law of God, reflects the light of Christ. And, And so the sun and the moon, Christ and his word, shall be dark in the time of God's wrath. And uh, that means the Bible is no longer saving people. There is no more light shining into the darkness of this world. 
and and through the power of God's word, saving sinners, translating them out of that darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. No, now it's all finished. It, it, the God's salvation program uh, is completed and everyone's spiritual condition has been established and set and will not change. And, and uh, no matter what, it, if we were somehow, uh, by God's grace, able to reach every human being in the world at, at this time and tell them October 7th, 2015 is the very likely day of the world. And if, if all of the people took it seriously and, and they came to God and they came to the Bible crying out, beseeching him for mercy and, and crying like Esau, have you no more blessing for me, even for me, O Father? The answer would be, there is no more blessing, no more salvation. The door is shut. And, and when men cry, Lord, Lord, open to me, the answer is, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Uh, when men desire to die, as Revelation chapter 9 tells us, their death will flee from them. That is, when they desire to die in Christ, identification in his death, salvation flees from them. When men today desire a drop, not a bucket, not a cupful, but a drop, the, the smallest of of portions of water that they might cool their tongue that has been set aflame in the spiritual fire of judgment day. When they desire the smallest amount of mercy, there is no water. As God explains in Luke 16 in that parable, there is a great gulf fixed between us and you and they which would come from hence. The true believers, certainly, we would. It, it is our desire for our own family. Of course it is. For our friends, for our neighbors, for strangers, even for our enemies. It is the heart God has placed within his people to desire to share the word of God and that others might hear and become saved and, and have that cool water of the gospel quench their thirst and and cover over their sins. Yes, but God says, even they which would desire to come from hence to you cannot. There is an inability. There is no way that God's people can bring salvation if God has determined, and he has, that there is not to be any more salvation. He is sovereign God. He is the, the one, the Almighty, that is sovereign concerning whom he saves, and he's already saved them all. He's sovereign concerning when he saves, and he's already um, had his day of salvation. And he's sovereign concerning where he saves. He saved outside of the churches a great multitude during the little season of the latter rain. But the latter rain is over and done. The great tribulation has ended. It is judgment day. It's the day of the wrath of God. And a time when the sun and the moon is dark. And, and there is no light. Judgment day is a time of intense spiritual darkness. A thick darkness that may be felt if we use the language of the darkness that came upon Egypt when God brought judgment upon them. Well, this is a spiritually thick darkness. And God, by the way, says of that darkness in Egypt that it may be felt because that's what the blind do. The blind are in darkness and they go around with their hands feeling for something in front of them so they don't bump into it. And, and God has now brought darkness on the world 
that has left unsafe mankind in their blindness. They will remain in blindness, and there will never be sight granted them again. It, it is over. It is done with. We have entered into those days after that tribulation, according to Mark 13, 24, and the whole period of time is a dark period, and that's why God speaks of it in some places as the evening. It, it is the end of the 12-hour workday, and, and when the evening is come, what, is, what does the Bible tell us? And first of all, Christ makes a point of explaining that there are 12 hours in the day. And then uh, he also gives a parable of a 12-hour workday. And 11 hours, the, the work continues as usual. And then there's some change at the 11th hour when uh, a whole bunch of workers are added for the final hour. And that hour typifies the Great Tribulation. And then the 12-hour day comes to a close and Jesus defines a day as 12 hours. And then the night comes. And here's what it says in John 9, in verse 3 and 4. Uh, it says, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, what are the works of God? Well, it says in John chapter 6, verse 29, this is the work of God, that ye believe. The work of God is faith, the saving faith of the Lord Jesus Christ that grants belief to the sinner. And, and this is the work of God. And in John 9, Christ is going to heal a blind man by giving him sight to illustrate the work of God is salvation or that ye believe. And then it says in verse 4 of John 9, I must work the works of him that sent me. The work, again, John 6, 29, is that ye believe. So Jesus is saying, I must save. I must work the works of him that sent me. I must perform the, the work of saving sinners while it is day. While it is day. Because that is the day of salvation. And Christ explains the length of the day. I mention it, but it's just to give you the verse. In John 11, verse 9. Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not. Because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Now, according to Christ's own definition, the day is 12 hours. So if you walk in the day, you're fine. You have the light of the world. But if you walk in the night, now when would the night come? At the end of the 12 hours. At the end of the work that the laborers performed in the vineyard, and that especially that 11th and 12th hour typified the one hour of great tribulation, then comes the night. Then comes the time after the tribulation, in those days after the tribulation. Isn't it amazing that the Bible speaks of spiritual darkness coming after the tribulation in many places? Matthew 24, 29. And then we read of that parable of 12 hours in the vineyard, the workers are working, that special, distinct 11th to 12th hour, and God, of course, elsewhere, speaks of the Great Tribulation as one hour, and then it says comes evening. The 12-hour day concludes after that special one last one-hour period, and then comes the evening or the night. And, and that is the time we are in. In those days, after that tribulation, there is spiritual night. And going back to John 
9 in verse 4, uh, while it is day, those works of salvation, the work that men believe uh, are being performed. And then it says at the end of the verse, the night cometh when no man can work. And that can only be referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of salvation ends. The, the last hour, the 11th to the 12th hour, typifying the great tribulation, comes to a close. That finishes the work day, the day of 12 hours long, the day of salvation. And then comes the night and I can no longer work. I can no longer grant the sinner a drop of water. I can no longer open up the door of heaven. I can no longer allow the men identification in my death. I can no longer shine brilliantly as the sun into the world, into the dark hearts of man and illuminate them and create within a new heart and a new spirit. I can no longer send rivers of water into dry, thirsty lands, and wherever those waters go, they bring life. It, it No, the gospel, the wonderful, beautiful gospel of the Bible has come to a close regarding salvation, and the evangelization program of God is over with. It, it is no more. The, the night has come. Christ can no longer work. And, and that's what God is saying here. And um, Joel 2.10, The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now again, the, the stars, we know the sun points to Christ, eternal God. The moon to the word of God, the Bible. And the stars to the body of believers. That was the promise God gave to Abraham, thy seed will be as the stars of heaven for multitude. And God did save a great multitude and were the seed, the promised seed in Christ. As the seed was singular, referring to Jesus, but Galatians makes a point of saying that we are part of that seed if we're in him. And, and so the stars of the sky the the lights in the sky we have the great light that lightens the day the sun the lesser light that lightens the night the moon and also at night you look up into the sky and there you can see sometimes uh, a sky full of stars and and there god is indicating that there is the promise i gave to abraham that these stars represent those that I will save. But when it comes to judgment day, the stars shall withdraw their shining. The very same statement is made in Joel 3. It says in Joel 3 verse 15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And it, it's the same Hebrew word in both verses, translated as withdrawal. It is uh, Strong's number 622, translated as gather or gathereth in many places. For instance, in Exodus chapter 23. In Exodus 23, it says in verse 16, in the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field, or, or withdrawn, you, you gather the fruit. Gathering the fruit is gathering in thy labors. And, and uh, notice here the feast of harvest is both first fruits and the final feast of ingathering in the Bible uh, relates those two seasons with God's salvation program as the first fruits were gathered um, during the church age, all those saved during 
the 1955 years of the church age, and the final fruits were those saved during the little season of the Great Tribulation. And they are the Feast of Harvest. And now we're looking um, very excitedly and with great expectation ahead to October 7th, 2015, as the last day of Judgment Day, the, the 1600th day since May 21, 2011, the overall 10,000th day since Judgment began at the House of God, way back in May 21, 1988, and October 7th, 2015, also happens to be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was always held in conjunction with the Feast of Ingathering. So it is also the last day of the Feast of Ingathering when the fruit is brought in. And, and uh, it, it's the time when the precious fruit of the earth has been received. And it, it's as though God's elect are coming to God, not empty, but they themselves are the fruit. And in a sense, the offering unto God during the feast. And that day concludes the feast. And the Bible indicates that this is, I think, definite. That the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles slash in gathering will be the last day of the world. Now, there's, there's a great possibility that will be October 7th, 2015. But the language of the Bible concerning the last day, linking it to tabernacles, and the fact that that feast has not yet been spiritually fulfilled, while the other two, Passover and Pentecost, were indicates God will fulfill the feast by bringing about the world's end. And, and so when we put all of that together, we can see how the gathering unto him is pointing to the final uh, exodus or leaving of this world and entering into the new heaven and new earth. Now, one other uh, interesting thing concerning this word withdrawing, as it says here, that the stars withdraw, um, they're shining, they're shining. And just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, spiritually speaking, true believers receive our light from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're withdrawing our shining, that this uh, would relate to the shining forth of the Word of God, the gospel into the world. And in this case, it would tie in with God's people withdrawing their activity concerning the sending forth of the Word of God into the world. Remember, right after May 21, 2011, and well, first of all, remember the um, incredible amount of um, uh, involvement and activity the people of God uh, had in getting out the word, blowing the trumpet to warn the world of that day of judgment. And then afterwards, afterwards, after um, day after day of that intense activity on May 22nd, 2011, Everything was quiet. Everything was quiet. The track distribution stopped. The track trips overseas and track distribution at home. The uh, broadcasts um, encouraging people to seek the Lord while he may be found ended. The, j just all the activity of God's people outside of the churches where he was working to save the great multitude in the sending forth of the latter rain, it stopped completely. And, and, and why? Why? Well, because God brought to pass the day of judgment. And yes, and, and, and it was the true believers, the true believers that realized we have nothing to share. We have nothing more we can say. 
we, we don't know what to say to people. And, of course, at first it was out of confusion, but it was at the will of God. That God set that up so his people would be silent so that they would not continue on evangelizing as usual. The, the print presses went silent. The broadcast went silent pretty much except for music and scripture reading. And everything went silent. Uh, it, it was the time of withdrawing. The children of God, the elect, were willingly withdrawing the activity of sending forth the gospel into the world. Now, at that time, it was out of confusion since we have learned that we're not to do that, that it is judgment day, that we do not sow seed on land that has been barraged or, or destroyed by fire and brimstone. You, you, you cannot sow seed on, physically on that kind of land, nor can you sow it spiritually on a world that has had fire and brimstone raining down upon it since judgment began uh, on, on this whole earth on May 21, 2011. And so willingly, with understanding, more and more God's people withdraw their shining. Oh no, I'm not going to go hand out a Does God Love You track. Why would I give anyone false encouragement that God is still saving? And I'm not going to direct anyone to any kind of ministry. I don't care who it is or where it is. Or, or what they previously stood for. I'm not going to go against God's will for this time period. doesn't matter what his will was, uh, for instance, uh, for the almost 2,000 years of the church age. Once the church age ended, then we don't send people to the church. It's over. It, the previous history doesn't matter anything. Likewise, when uh, there was a time we would direct people to a faithful ministry and say, go there. And I, I did that all the time. And eBible Fellowship was um, uh, developed really for that purpose to, as an assist to point people to another faithful ministry because we saw how God was working. But God's no longer working there. And we're not going to point people there because we used to, because historically it was a faithful ministry. Well, that's past. That's over and done with. Now, every faithful ministry will withdraw their shining. They will agree with the word of God that there is darkness that has come upon the earth. And they're not going to insist against that. They'll be fighting against God. And there'll be no profit to it anyway to, to go out and give people false hope and false encouragement to pray to God that you might be saved today. Beseech the Lord. Well, there's what difference is there with that and with the pastor standing in the pulpit giving his congregation false assurance that uh, you're in the right place and you can be blessed and you keep coming and God will save you or accept these things and there's false assurance in the church and there's false assurance in any ministry today that is telling people it's the day of salvation just because they see the physical sun in the sky and the physical moon at night and the physical stars they they wrongly interpret that to mean it's still the day of salvation when God very clearly has spoken of the day of salvation spiritually and the night as a spiritual night. And it cannot be discerned what, what God has done by looking outside the Bible and looking at the ongoing continuance of the physical celestial bodies and say, well now, since the, the physical 24-hour day period is continuing, it's the day of salvation. That is incorrect. It is what often leads people astray when they go out of the Bible. When we look in the Bible, we see 
very definitely what God has in mind. He, he brought darkness on the world immediately after the tribulation of those days. And now the, uh, the true believers, the true believers withdraw their shining. And yes, we're commanded to prophesy again. And by God's grace, he's opening up opportunities more and more where we can share the truth of the Bible to the people of the world as long as we're within the boundaries and the confines of the Bible itself and what the Bible is declaring that it's judgment day. God says, yes, publish that Babylon has fallen and all the information of what that consists of, that judgment consists of, the spiritual judgment, the elect left alive and living on the earth to be tried and tested throughout the day of judgment, and all the things we've learned were in order to feed sheep. We, we have that task, and we've been given uh, uh, that job to do, and, and so there's no problem with sharing the word of God with all the world, but as far as offering the slightest bit of encouragement to a sinner that God might still save you today, well then, that that is something contrary to what the Bible is saying, and God does not permit it. Uh, he, he is not with someone or a ministry that is doing that kind of thing. All right, let, let's go on to verse 11 of Joel chapter 2. And Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. And of course, what is the voice of Jehovah? It is the word of God. That, that is the voice. If we go back to Joel 3, that we just looked at a little, little while ago, and we saw the similar statement, in verse 15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Then look at verse 16. Jehovah also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now, Zion and Jerusalem are synonymous, and they both point to the body of believers, to the elect. And, and again, that's further confirmation the great army that Joel 2 was speaking of, the, the camp of God that is very great, is Zion. It is the heavenly Jerusalem or, or Jerusalem that is comprised of everyone that God has saved. And God utters his voice from there because it's the, the children of God, the true believers, that declare what the Bible says. And so it comes out of our mouths as we share the teachings of God's word that God is roaring out of Zion and uttering his voice from Jerusalem. And it goes on to say in Joel 3:16, And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but Jehovah will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now can you see how God is there tying in the time after the tribulation with the language of Joel 3.15, the darkened sun, the earth and heaven shaking. Uh, there's m so many verses, that, and we've already gone to a few of them, that locks that in to the time after the tribulation. And then he speaks of himself being the hope and, and the strength of his people because... His people are alive and living on the earth in those days after that tribulation, in the day of judgment. And he is uttering his voice. Uh, it is coming out of Zion, the body of believers, during that time. The people of God have hope in him, hope in his word. And isn't it really uh, amazing when we look at this stretch over the course of these years since God shut the door of heaven on May 21, 2011, and we see how 
downcast, downtrodden we were early on, afterwards, so confused and troubled, we really didn't know what to teach from the Word of God, the Bible. That, that was the most disturbing thing. What is God doing? Is there salvation? Isn't there salvation? Uh, are we in the tribulation? Has the tribulation ended? Did God shut the door? Or And so many questions. Uh, it, it, it disturbed us because we, we need to know the truth. We need to know sound doctrine in order to be witnesses for God and, and to share the teachings of the Word of God. And yet for some time, God did not open up information, and then slowly he did, and slowly he did, and the more he did, and the more we learn, as Romans 2.5 says, that God does in the day of wrath reveal the righteous judgment of God, and that's exactly what he's done. Over the course of the 1600 days, God has opened up more and more insight, and we've seen how beautifully things harmonize and fit together, and we have gained understanding once again, and and, and it has been extremely uh, encouraging to the people of God because we know, we know what the Bible is saying. We know what God did. That that again that was the disturbing thing we were unsure unclear and it affected our witness but now once again we know and god has uttered his voice from the people of god and he has become our hope and we have a good expectation for the completion of judgment day taking place after 10,000 days and, and this has been a great comfort and encouragement to each one of God's people. Well, this voice uh, of God, of course, we uh, were discussing this in our study in the book of Revelation recently, where uh, there's two words in the book of Revelation used over and over again. And it's uh, the two Greek words are megas phone where we get our English word megaphone from those two words. And megas means great, and phone means voice. And in many passages in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 11, in Revelation 14, in Revelation 16, in Revelation 19, megas phone is used. There was a great voice from heaven, we read. And then God goes on to describe some aspect of Judgment Day. That is, it is with a great voice he introduces the information regarding the Day of Judgment. And the, the, the voice that is uh, going before his great army is the voice of the Word of God. It is that righteous revelation of the judgment of God. As the Bible is opening up to the people of God, and God is giving us understanding concerning it, then the voice of God is speaking, and we are sharing it with the people of the world, as we have been commanded to do to publish these things and, and this is uh, what God is referring to here, that Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army. It can also have some relationship to, of course, the worldwide declaration of May 21, 2011, Judgment Day, that also came forth from the Bible and was declared all over the earth. And uh, that was before the army or before Judgment Day took effect. That is also, I think, another aspect of, of what's in view here. And then it says in Joel 2.11, For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And the, the word terrible is also the same Hebrew word translated as fearful and dreadful. 
very fearful. It is the great day of Jehovah and is a very terrible day. It's a fearful day. Well, it says that he is strong that executeth his word. Let's look at this language of executing the word of God in Psalm 9 and verse 16. Jehovah is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands, Higion Sila. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Jehovah, let not man prevail. Let the heathen or the nations be judged in thy sight. Now, uh, Psalm 9 is describing what took place when God shut the door of heaven. He brought the whole world into the condition of hell. The nations have been turned into hell or the grave because it guaranteed their death. And, and notice also in that context, God gives us a little bit more hope and encouragement when he says the needy, and he'll, he'll refer to the poor, that which are pointing to his people, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. God knows that his people have to be greatly troubled, and, and, and they are being severely tried. It's a, it's a um, severe time of testing. It's the trial of their faith. He has put them to the fire of judgment day. The, the world is under his wrath and being punished. And he left his people therein. And two thirds are cut off and die. But a third part he's going to bring through the fire. And, and yet here's, here's that encouragement. You'll not always be forgotten. Your expectation will not perish forever. Continue on hoping and trusting in him, in the word of God, continue enduring unto the end. For he that endures unto the end shall be saved. That is, the one that is able to make it through has been saved, and that will be the evidence of it, that he will abide, uh, he will endure the fiery flames of God's wrath, and come out the other side, he'll make it through. Now in Psalm 149, it says, beginning in verse 5, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand, to execute vengeance upon the heathen, or the nations, and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye Jehovah. So we see that God executes his word and the saints execute the judgment written. They both are executing the word of God. And uh, this passage fits with um, that Christ judges the world with the saints. Uh, he, he is judging the world with them. It's the same in the New Testament. In John chapter 5, it says of the Lord Jesus in verse 27, And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And compare that with Jude verse 14. And Jude is that little book right before Revelation. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. There is Christ coming with ten thousands of his saints. And ten thousands would point to the completeness of all the saints, all the elect are involved in the judgment process 
They are executing the judgment written. And all of God's people are involved in that today, or they should be. They should be executing the judgment written. We, we are uh, sharing the things that the Bible says, and in so doing, we're fulfilling those verses, like in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship Sunday Bible Study. For more information or to hear additional Bible studies, be sure to visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com.